avec le soutien de Sabam for Culture. I'd like to say welcome to um, James Nice, um, who's here for the Freaksville podcast. Hello. And in conjunction with the Federation of French Independent Labels. How are you? I'm very good. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Um, tell me what you're doing here at the moment. I believe there's a masterclass this evening. Yeah, so I'm doing a masterclass this evening about running independent labels, small boutique labels, I guess. I run a couple of labels. One is called Lady Stu Crepuscule, which originally was founded in Brussels in 1980. And there's a sister label as well called Factory Benelux. Okay. Um, this is my first time back in Brussels since COVID and the lockdown. So it's nice to be back after three or even four years. So I guess Factory Records, does that have um, um, a connection with Factory Records from Manchester? Yeah. So back in 1979, uh, a quite famous venue opened up in Brussels called the Plan K. And okay. a lot of really interesting groups came to play there. Some of the first groups were Joy Division. Yeah. And as a result of that, um, because a, a number of people um, were involved in promoting those gigs, mm -hmm. decided they'd quite like to start an independent record label. Okay. So they initially teamed up with Factory Records, uh, who were a Manchester record label who had Joy Division, Durutti Column, yeah. Certain Ratio. All of these groups came to play at Plan K. And Factory thought it would be cool to have a, a European sub-label. Okay. called Factory Benelux to make their records and spare recordings available mm -hmm. on the continent. So Factory Benelux started in the middle of 1980. Okay. And then at pretty much the same time, the same people, and that was really a guy called Michelle Deval and a lady called Anique Honoré, mm -hmm. uh, wanted to start up their own label with their own artists. And that was Ladies du Crepuscule, okay. which that started just at the end of 1980. And I think probably most people see those labels as very much defined by the 80s, that they were leading labels in the 80s. Yeah. And now what I do is mainly curate the heritage of those labels. We still do some new releases. Okay. Um, so it's a kind of retro futuristic thing, I suppose. Okay. Um, how are the, um, both the labels connected? How did that work? They were quite separate, really. I, I think people always knew that Factory Benelux and Crepuscule were one in the same organization. But I guess the main difference is that anything on Factory Benelux has to have a relation to Factory. Yeah, okay. Um, whereas Crepuscule could do anything. So Crepuscule was and is uh, a much more cosmopolitan label with artists from all over the world, different genres. So it could be left field pop music, minimalist music. Okay. Um, and I guess the famous artists on Crepuscule, certainly from the 80s, were people like Wim Mertens, Tuxedo Moon, okay. Anna Domino, Isabel Antenna, Paul Haig, people like that. How did you get involved with the um, running record labels at first or involved in record labels? I, like many people, um, because I'm of a certain age. I started doing a fanzine when I was at school. Then I started a cassette label. So I was manufacturing cassettes by hand. And some of those were by some factory groups like Section 25. Um, and then I started putting out singles when I was 18. So I was still at school. Okay. Um, and then it went from there. So I did a few um, of my own albums um, while I was at university. Did Your own music? No, I did one album by William Burroughs, who oh, was yeah? a famous American writer of, of his readings. Um, and I did uh, a couple of compilations, which were very based on Crepuscule, because I was a huge fan of Crepuscule. And then when I finished university, I came over to Brussels with the idea of staying for about a year, <gasps> really just to hang around on the scene, because I thought it was going to be like being in Hemingway's Paris in the 1920s. <laughs> Tuxedo Moon were here, Anna Domino was here, and they were Americans. Yeah. Um, so it was it was a pretty magical time. I really enjoyed it, and I ended up staying for four and a half years from um, 87 through to 91. And was it like coming most Paris? Um, it was very interesting. Um, Brussels was quite different then. There was a lot of dereliction. It was a really cheap place to live, so all these penniless American artists can come and live here. Um, yeah, it was really interesting. I can't compare it to Hemingway's Paris in the 20s because I'm not quite that old. Uh, <laughs> but it was a very formative period for me. And I worked at Crepus School for about a year, not okay. really for that long. And then I had a big argument with <laughs> the owner. Okay. And then I went to work for Played Again Sam for about three oh, and a yeah. half years. So yeah. I worked as their production manager and still carried on doing things for Crepuscule. Okay. Um, and then much later when Crepuscule had really run out of steam as a label, yeah. um, I 
took it over and took on the, the catalogue and, and took on the names about 15, 20 years ago. Did you re-release things or did you just, did you have new bands? A, a bit of both. I re-released a lot of the catalogue anyway. Yeah. And then in the past 10 years, we've also done quite a lot of new records on Crepuscule, which are artists that I think are in the spirit of the original label, mm -hmm. um, but obviously doing new music. So we've done albums by... Um, Helen Marnie, who's a singer with Lady Tron. Oh, yeah. Um, an album by White Sea, which was a keyboard player from M83. A Brussels band called Les Panties, who were fantastic, <laughs> fortunately split up. Uh, their name doesn't really translate outside of Belgium, France, and parts of Canada, unfortunately. No, it, well, you can't really call them neckers, can you? <laughs> no, well, I gather it means in French, it means tights or stockings. It does, yeah. But not in English. No, I don't think we use that so much in England. It's very American, isn't it? Um, yeah, it would. I think it's something I'll talk about in the masterclass tonight. But you can have a band where everything is perfect and yeah. everything about them was perfect. The music, the look, everything, except the name was just wrong. And you could spend as much time and money as you like trying to promote that band. They would have been perceived yeah. As a novelty act. Yeah. And what um, kind of music was it? Well, it was ideal for us because it, it was um, really nice sort of pop cold wave, mm -hmm. but modern because they were a modern band, um, brilliant looking band. Um, and they had a great attention to detail in terms of the, the sound recording and their presentation. There was nothing not to like except the name. Yeah, the name doesn't really inspire that kind of image, does not it? Does it really? <laughs> no, and I think if you've got a name that doesn't work or if you put a bad cover on a record, yeah. uh, then you're suggesting to people from the get-go that you're not competent yeah. or not to be taken seriously. And that was one of the trademarks of um, Crepuscule and Factory Benelux um, in the 80s, really inherited from Factory, that presentation was hugely important. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. It's very um, stylish and it does stand out. It's very well known. Factory is very well known for...
Yeah, Factory, very well known, but Crepuscule also. So Crepuscule had a couple of in-house designers. Okay. Um, there was a, a painter and typographer called Benoit Hennebert, mm -hmm. who really was a genius. Uh, a guy called Jean-Francois Octave, who was uh, an, mainly an illustrator at that time, mm -hmm. although the work he does now is very different. He does a lot of public art uh, and a couple of others as well. So these people had done quite a lot of posters for the Plan K and then graduated towards doing record art. We have worked with one or two of them since then, but um, as with any designers, their style moves on. So the work they're doing 40 years later isn't necessarily like the work they did now. Okay. And they're not necessarily working in record sleeve design. So sometimes we've gone back to original people. Other times we're using new people to do artwork, but it all has to have the same kind of DNA yes. as things did before, because I don't like using the word brand, but it is important having an image uh, that people can identify with and trust. Factory does have that. So I guess um, Crepuscule um, has that kind of thing as well, yeah. Yeah, well, I suppose it was easier for Factory to keep its identity fairly pure because they went bankrupt in 1992. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, Peter Saville, who was their design director, is a great example of someone who the work he does now, um, I'm not going to say it's uh, not identifiable as the Peter Saville who did those early sleeves, but his work has progressed through all different sorts of times and places, but it's still amazing. Right. Um, and it's still pretty identifiable. Um, also, I believe you wrote a book. Could you um, tell us a bit about that and yeah, I read how a, that came about? Well, I read a book about Factory called Shadow Players um, because, as with the Crepus School, I was a big fan of Factory. And it originally started life as a, a DVD sort of documentary. Okay. That I feel myself fairly, um, fairly <laughs> crudely, I have to say. And that was probably about 15 years ago. Um, so quite a lot of people were still around then. I was able to speak to Tony Wilson and lots of other players. Um, and I thought about doing a book then, but I decided not to because I thought Tony Wilson wouldn't like it. Because oh, it, well, it's a very factual book. Um, and Tony Wilson was someone that was more interested in myth than fact. Okay. So I thought he would probably say of any book I wrote, this is just like the accountant's history of factory <laughs> records. It's, it's not interesting. I didn't want to write a book that the first person that everybody would go to for an opinion on it would probably say, eh, whatever. Of course. Um, but after Tony died, um, it became a lot easier mm -hmm. to write that book and for a lot of people who were close to Tony to actually be quite frank yeah. about what had gone right and what had gone wrong. So it liberated the history in a bit. Someone said to me at the time, it was a bit like um, when Francis Bacon, the artist, died, that actually meant that people could take a, a better view. I'm sure it's the same for lots of biographies. Yeah. So um, his passing meant that I was freed up to do the book and, and really tell the story um, um, and I really enjoyed doing that book. And I think it's probably the best book I've ever written. Um, it would be lovely if it was still in print, but I think it was too big to get reprinted. Okay. There is a, a version coming out in Japan soon. Okay. So that'll be quite nice. Yeah. Um, there was a version in France as well, which I think the translator improved the writing. So it's probably worth getting the French version because it's probably a better book than the one I wrote. <laughs> yeah, that can happen. <laughs> um, so the future of um, Factory Benelux and uh, Crepuscule, how do you see that at the moment? Factory Benelux can only do things that are related to Factory. Yeah. So that's really back catalogue because an awful lot of those groups, there's always going to be interest in them because they're factory groups. Mm -hmm. um, so the groups that I work with mainly are Durati Column, yeah. Section 25, um, several others, The Wake. Um, they're the, the core catalogue that continues to sell. Durati Column I work with quite closely anyway on on administering their catalogue, and I'm writing a book about them at the moment. All right. And Durati Column, I think, are um, inevitably the biggest groups on Factory will always be Joy Division New Order. Of course. But I think history will judge Durati Column to be the second most important group yeah. on Factory, not Happy Mondays. Um, <laughs> because his music is so timeless and so other, um, it's, it's something that generations of people can yeah, discover, so. and it, it doesn't sound dated. It's just 
its own thing, whether you want to call it neoclassical or new age or, or yeah, Durutti column is just such a fascinating story. It's a very human story. Uh, Vinnie Riley is, is a really very interesting character on all sorts of levels. Um, and his sort of manager drummer, Bruce Mitchell is one of the most switched on entertaining people it's ever been my pleasure to meet. And he's 82 now. It's wow. fantastic uh, talking to him. And that book's really, a, a, it's about the relationship between these three men, between Vinnie Riley, Bruce Mitchell, and Tony Wilson, who was the Durati Column manager. And Tony founded Factory to release records by Durati Column. And it's a story that hasn't been told because it's very difficult to tell. Um, there's parts of it that are quite sensitive. Okay. Um, I'm not waiting for anybody to die to do that. Um, so that, that's, been, that's been going on for about three years now. Um, so I'm really enjoying that book, but I think that's probably the last music book I will do. Yeah. And it's an interesting balancing act, writing a book about your main artist. You have to be quite careful. Yeah, yeah. So there, like you say, the sensitive issues. Yeah. And um, so back to the um, curating the labels now and how you see it in the future. How would the, um, as we were saying, the really like beautiful objects, is, are the reissues going to be similar, exactly the same or repackaged? Or My favorite time for running a label was when we were just doing CDs. Okay. So you could make a CD with 70 minutes of music on. Um, it sounds great. Mm -hmm. It doesn't cost much. The artwork's quite nice. You can have sleeve yeah. notes in there. And it's not particularly harmful for the environment. Yeah. Now we're at a time where vinyl has become the lead format again, certainly the vanity format. Um, everything's a lot harder around vinyl. It's harder to make. It doesn't sound as good. I think in terms of its environmental impact, it's the diesel format of music. Yeah. Awful lot of 
oil and plastic and paper involved, its carbon footprint in terms of moving it around is far higher. I did um, see something recently, um, some article on the news that they are starting to make it more environmentally friendly, but I'm not exactly sure what they're uh, using. I don't know. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to take it to the extreme and say, well, we shouldn't have any physical formats and let's just stream everything. No. Um, but... Uh, I, I wonder why the music industry, which prides itself on being green, is just pumping out vinyl. Yeah. Uh, I don't get it. And it's also very expensive. I mean, people are charging large sums of money for double albums. Um, I just think it was nicer and more music focused when you could just go and buy a CD for 10 quid. But the world doesn't agree with me. <laughs> so I can't just decide to stick my head in the sand and only do what I want to do. Because if you're managing people's catalogs, you have to follow the market to some extent. Yeah, yeah. So I try and keep, um, say, all of the Durati column catalog in print on vinyl as well as CD. Um, but then lots of people love having a limited edition. So you're trying to work out, well, what color do I press it in next? Yeah. Or do I have it as 180 gram vinyl for the audio files? Uh, and all these are sort of interesting decisions. But how relevant to music they are. Yeah. I don't know. So you have to keep things available in a format that more or less matches the market. Fortunately, most of the people I work with are people that have always really just been happy to do things at their own pace and not worry too much mm -hmm. about these things. So I don't usually get artists hassling me saying, can you make this available on vinyl? Or can you do this? Can you mm -hmm. do that? And in terms of how nice you can make an object, it depends on all sorts of things. I mean, how good was the original artwork? Yeah. Um, how much extra material is there? So, you know, can you turn what was originally a 45 minute album into a, a four CD box set? Yeah. Um, so it really varies from project to project. Um, and it's harder to talk about those things on a podcast than it is to simply show people things. The other thing that uh, you have to consider is how much time you've got available to do a project. And I guess the the very first Crepuscule release, which is quite a famous compilation called From Brussels with Love, which was a cassette journal back in November 1980 with lots of very well-known groups on from Factory and from other places as well as new music composers um, yeah. like... Michael Nyman, Brian Eno, Gavin Bryars. It was a fascinating object. Um, when we came to do a 40th anniversary edition, I wanted to do it as a, a sort of a hardback book okay. with a couple of CDs in, uh, with lots of photographs, lots of posters, lots of texts. And it took about two years to do it. Yeah. Uh, and it's really like doing about 50 projects rather than one because there are so many different tracks and rights to clear oh, for yeah. something like that. Um, so you, I mean, people love that release and then said, oh, are you going to do X project like that? There just isn't enough time no. in the day to do things to that really high standard. Um, so sometimes it's more just a question of thinking, well, this is a really good record and it's in a really good sleeve. That's enough. Yeah. It isn't always enough, but sometimes it is. Yeah. How do you, why do you think that it, everything moved from CD to vinyl again? Well, I can understand, I, I don't buy vinyl as, as a consumer, but I can understand that what you're buying uh, and what you're getting is a nice physical object. Yeah. It's a nicer physical object than a CD. And although I think that vinyl is overpriced, equally, if you're considering it to be an affordable art object, yeah. then it isn't overpriced. There is a certain satisfaction in, in playing a vinyl record because there's a ritual involved in mm -hmm. putting it on the turntable and putting the needle down, um, which I have indulged in occasionally over the last year or two. But for me, I just like playing music in the car. Okay. Uh, or things like that. I'm just playing it very loud. So I'm philistine about those things. Still on CD? Um, I can't get a CD player for my car now. So I do yeah. have to then bounce them down to my phone. Um, but yeah, I, I, I guess there are other reasons people like vinyl, but there are plenty of people who, who buy a vinyl and then don't really listen to it. Very true, yeah. Um, so yeah. all sorts of reasons. But the whole market 
has fragmented in so many ways. And there are so many different platforms now, um, you know, whether you want to buy a physical format, whether you want to stream, I guess one or two people might still buy download. I don't know. And then you've got Bandcamp. Yeah. There aren't any extra sales involved in these things though. Not so really. you've got the same amount of sales and revenue spread over so many different platforms now. That's a complicating factor. Yeah, yeah. And what do you think of streaming yourself? Um, well, it's fine if people want to use that. I don't. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it generates maybe 10% of our revenue, digital revenue. Okay. So it's not nothing. Um, but I don't think, I think it tends to be most of our digital revenue comes from songs rather than the more abstract things. Okay. So the artists who perform well on streaming are the artists who uh, write nice figurative pop songs mm -hmm. by and large. Uh, if it's something that's really quite avant-garde um, and challenging, that's something that won't pick up money mm -hmm. from uh, streaming and digital, in my experience. And um, some of the, art the artists on um, that were on Factory Records, mm. are they still making music? Yeah. So um, New Order and a certain ratio are with Mute Records. Yes. Um, and the last... Uh, New Order album, uh, I don't know, about five years ago, was great. And it had two or three songs on it that were as good as anything they've done. That was fantastic. I don't, well, there is another Durati Column album in the works. Um, so that will come out in the next year or two. Um, I've had quite a long uh, career in making music available. And when I started, quite a lot of those groups were still active in their initial incarnations. Mm -hmm. And then they all stopped making music for yeah. a period of about 20 years and did other stuff. And then they come back to making music yeah. when they're um, reaching a certain age and, <laughs> and want a bit of excitement in their lives again. That's great. It doesn't always lead to people making brilliant records anymore. Mm -hmm. So I've had to take some tough decisions over the past few years about saying no yeah. to certain new uh, projects by people because it, it's nice that they're doing that and they return to play gigs. Um, but... Really, if a record is going to come out, certainly on vinyl, yeah. uh, it really needs to be a good record, mm -hmm. not just um, going through the motions. And there is just so much music out there now. Yeah. Um, I mean, regardless of people's age or, or position, I think when Crepuscule Factory, Factory Benelux started in 79, 1980, that was the post-punk boom. There were maybe about 500 um, indie labels around the world, mm -hmm. and there were probably about 500 really good bands. Yeah. These days, there are probably 5,000 or 50,000 labels. There are still only about 500 really good bands. Everything yeah. is spread very thinly in the same way that when you watch TV, you watch Netflix or Hulu or whatever. There's so much content being generated, but it isn't all that good. Yeah. Um, and we're at this saturation point, which makes it very difficult for new music to get noticed. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really sad. Maybe we should have a licensing committee that, um, you know, content creators have to appear before an audition because there aren't any gatekeepers anymore. Yeah. And for better or worse, um, labels like Crepuscule or Factory were cultural gatekeepers yeah. at the time. Uh, and a lot of creatives don't like that idea that there are people sort of having a say on whether or not you can put your music out there. Um, and I guess I don't have a view on whether it's better or worse, but it was easier. Mm -hmm. There wasn't this huge ocean of stuff to get lost in. Yeah. Um, would you say that you look into all these underground and listen to it still? Or? No. No. <laughs> uh, no, I don't. I mean, I do listen to new music, um, but there just isn't time in my life to investigate all these different things. Um, I mean, there are some some younger bands uh, that I do like. Um, there's, I live, I don't live in Brussels anymore. I live in a place called Norfolk yeah. in the UK. And there's a, a youngish band there called Let's Eat Grandma. Oh yeah. Who yeah. did really well. They've been around for a few years now. So they're not the sort of mysterious 17 year olds they were, but they were fantastic. And I think I'd have probably liked them even if they hadn't come out of my hometown pretty much. Um, but I really also like a guy called Stephen Wilson, who I find endlessly interesting, partly because he's only uh, a year younger than me, right. and yet he's still producing music. From which, Porcupine Tray, originally. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, his, the stuff he's doing is still as good as anything he's ever done, and he's yeah. maybe the exception rather than the rule. Um, so I do like uh, a lot of music. I don't tend to listen to the music I release because it's kind of like work. 
Yeah. Um, so <laughs> Bosman's I'm, holiday. Yeah, I'm curating it, I think, uh, with knowledge rather than sitting and listening to it all the time now. And what do you listen to in the car? Uh, so the things I listen to at the moment, um, so I'm listening to the new Porcupine Tree album, which I'm enjoying. Um, there's uh, a really obscure artist called Lucy Gooch or Gower, who sort of does this quite ethereal cocteau twinsy shoegaze uh, synth music I like. Um, and I'm afraid like half the world, I've been reinvestigating Kate Bush recently. Oh, yeah. Um, and I kind of wish that quite a lot of people, more people had taken a leaf out of her book and done your best work and then quietly withdrawn yeah. and leave the mystery intact. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Hold your fear in check, my dear. It's got no place here. There's no need to fight. Just drift away on the new day. Find yourself a better way to meet the future. It's all that you crave. A silhouette of the new day. Um, and in terms of um, touring and um, live gigs, Crepuscule, or did they tour a lot for bands from Crepuscule? They did. Um, I mean, the idea that Michel Deval in particular had um, in the early 80s was that artists, because most of the artists weren't Belgian, they were from America, Britain, uh, other countries. The idea was that they, would, they were encouraged to come and live in Brussels um, because it was cheap. Uh, and you could afford to do it, and to do collaborations with each other. 
Um, and then kind of flowing from that, there were a number of package tours that were organized that would tour around Belgium or, or Europe where you would have some or all of these groups uh, perhaps rotating their lineups as well. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of that in the 1980s. Um, but then it was a very different market because then your main source of income was selling records yeah. and touring was something that some of them liked and some of them didn't. Some of them earned money from, some didn't. Um, but it was very much in support of selling records, mm -hmm. whereas now the, the shape of the market has changed entirely. Yeah. Um, and I find it astonishing now that we've moved to dynamic pricing for ticket sales. Yeah. Um, I can't imagine paying huge amounts of money to go and see a gig, but lots of people do. Lots of people do, yeah. Um, I think a lot of smaller bands um, probably sell a lot, get a lot of their earnings from merchandise as well. Yeah, and I suppose that comes back to producing artifacts as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I like buying uh, a group CD. If I go and see an artist and I like them, I, I really like going and buying their vinyl or their CD from the merch stand because you've got that direct contact. And I've done it on behalf of other people. Uh, I really like an artist called Lone Lady at the moment who mm -hmm. we, we did a sort of did a record by last year. Mm -hmm. um, and she toured recently. So I helped her out doing a merch at a couple of shows. And it's quite nice and interesting just talking to the public and yeah. seeing what their response to things in, what they want, what they value. Yeah. Um, so that's quite nice. She was also someone that was really good to do a record with on Crepuscule because she is a current artist, mm -hmm. but her music sort of harks back to the post-punk past. So she was fairly ideal as well. Okay. So in terms of merchandise, um, T-shirts as well or... Um, strange objects? Is there anything you do? Um, we do a lot of t-shirts. Um, I still like to have the focus on music and music carriers. I think if people want to buy handwritten lyrics by people, that's okay. I mean, it's not something I would do. <laughs> Fun things like badges. I mean, we do a lot of postcards, which we just give out to people. Um, what I've done four or five times in the last few years, if we've, we've just done a compilation CD, that we send out with mail order. So that has some tracks by our artists on, and then it just has other tracks on by people that we like. Okay. Who have said, yeah, you can have a track by us. So, I mean, the last one had Stephen Wilson and New Order on. They're not on our label, mm -hmm. but it's just nice to do that. Yeah. Um, so things like that I like doing. I guess I don't really like feeling that we're overcharging people for things, yeah. even if they're willing to pay a lot for them. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, that just seems as though you're, it doesn't sit comfortably with me. No. I like to offer people a good, uh, a good, fairly high quality item at a reasonable price. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you just um, want to elaborate on the, um, the way you think the, um, future of the two labels and maybe how long you you think you'll be involved i um <clears throat> i think i'm a lifer in music it's <laughs> something that i've done since i was 16 17 and i've never really completely gone away from it there have been a couple of times when um I mean, my other career is in the law so there have been a couple of times when i've prioritized that over making records mm -hmm. but the thing that stuck with me all through my life so far, and I'm 56 now, is making records, releasing okay. records with other people. So it will never go away. And I've always done it, and, and you can scoff at this or not, I've always done it not for money, um, not to try and get in on the uh, drugs and sex scene, but because I've seen it as a, a service thing. Mm -hmm. um, in service of, of the art that I like. And I may have a very narrow taste in music, but uh, I feel very committed to those artists and those genres. So I'll always carry on doing that. And having built up a fairly large catalog over the years, it would be wrong of me to then say, oh, I've had enough of that now. I'm going to go and do something else. So I will always carry on doing it until I drop dead. But um, <laughs> I'm focusing really more on administering the catalogue that I've got now yeah. rather than going out and looking for new things and promoting and selling new music involves a great deal more work yeah. than uh, artists who established a cult reputation 
several years ago yeah. and their records really sell themselves. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to spend too much time on promotion and things like that. I can just do the the heavy lifting stuff of keeping it available yeah. and making sure they get paid. That doesn't sound very glamorous or exciting, um, but that is what I do. I do still occasionally get excited about new music and about just before lockdown, I really wanted to make uh, an album with a Brussels group called mm -hmm. Panther who were just great, um, sort of uh, sort of electro pop duo trio, um, who then decided to split up the night before we had a discussion about <laughs> making their album. So that was a shame. So in a way, that kind of broke my spirit on trying to do new music. Um, but yeah, so the way forward for me is managing the yeah. catalog of the groups that I work with, um, and in particular, the sort of half dozen groups that really have quite a big profile, yeah. like Durati Column or, or Joseph K or Section 25 or 23 Skidoo, um, and just do the best I can by those artists. Mm -hmm. um, but if something else comes along that really, really enthused me, uh, then I would do another new record. Okay. And I've never been bothered about losing money on records as long as the label group as a whole makes money. Yeah. I've never costed out a record. Okay. beforehand and said, okay, well, we can only spend this much on that. I just do what I think is required for that particular project. Okay. And we've not often been caught out. And um, when you're talking about your own music taste, you said it's quite narrow. Um, are there real genres that you don't like? or My own music taste is quite wide, but the music I release okay. is quite narrow. So I would never release anything on any of my labels that I didn't like or which other people whose judgment I trust had said, you might not love it, but it's definitely in your wheelhouse. Okay. Um, and that has an advantage that if you've got a an audience who know that if they like one or two things you've done, they're probably going to like quite a lot of other things you've done. Yeah, yeah. Rather than just putting out any old catalogue that comes along and becomes available. Mm -hmm. um, so I like having that focus. I think keeping things quite narrow and close has really worked for me. Um, but that's another reason why there are only going to be a certain number of new or current artists who really fit that mold. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but no, I like being narrow minded. That's worked for me. <laughs> um, um, what the main differences between Crepuscule and um, Factory Benelux in the way you work? Or um... there's no difference at all. Okay. Um, I mean, what I'm very lucky with, with both of those catalogues, and it's really why I've been able to resurrect them and carry them on as long as I have, is that most of those artists ended up owning their own music. Mm -hmm. Factory famously always said that the artists own their own music. Yeah. Um, so when Factory went bankrupt in 1992, uh, most of those groups inherited their own rights. Mm -hmm. uh, with Crepuscule, for other reasons the artists have ended up owning their own rights. So 95% of the time when I release records, I'm working direct with the artist. Okay. I'm not licensing from another record company. Um, so I suppose having that direct relationship with artists is mm -hmm. something that's always appealed to me and has always worked well. But there are certain things you have to do. So you, you have to be scrupulously honest in your accounting. And I think one of the secrets of my success, if you can call it that, is that every six months, the artists get a royalty statement mm -hmm. and they get paid. And whether or not it's £25 or £2,500, um, every six months, they're reminded that you're out there doing stuff for them mm -hmm. and you value them and you're paying them that money. And it's astonishing how many labels just don't do that. I can imagine. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> so that's hugely important. Um, I always work on the basis of written agreements, not because I want to hold people to written agreements, uh, but because it's just a very basic way of uh, you setting out what you're going to do as a minimum yeah. for the artist and what they should be doing for you. Yeah. And then you can tell them off if they don't. Yeah. yeah. Well, you signed this thing saying that you would do so, that. So, yeah, kind of just formality, but. Yeah, it, it is very much a formality, but I think you're 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 making a statement, and there's an understanding that you you are serious about certain things. But I've never, uh, hardly ever, held someone 
uh, to an agreement. <laughs> because if a contractual arrangement or if a relationship breaks down, it's broken down. Yeah. It doesn't really work to carry on like that. And I don't need, I've never needed any artist enough to need to hang on to them to pay the bills. God, that's good. Um, do you see um, many movements, genres, uh, artists in particular that you think are influenced by Crepuscule and um, Factory Benelux? Um, well, I mean, an awful lot of groups, uh, an awful lot of people, designers, uh, people in the wider culture are hugely influenced by Factory Records. I mean, yeah. it's something that is, it's a story that people never tire of telling. Um, but I mean, Factory was was all about all sorts of things as well as music. It was about design, nightclub projects, heroic architectural failures, uh, all sorts of things. Um, Crepuscule was a bit more limited. Um, I think Crepuscule is something which is um, still valued by people. And in fact, um, only last week, a writer in England called Michael Bracewell, who's mm -hmm. quite well known, he's done about six novels, uh, said, oh, I'd like to send you uh, my new book. And I thought, well, there's probably a reason for that. So I brought it over with me on this trip to Brussels mm -hmm. and I started thumbing through it yesterday in my favorite bar, which is Daring Man. Oh. I love that bar. I don't know it. Where is it? Um, is it Ruda Catalin, I think? It's in the center. Okay. I love it anyway. Shea Martin is also called. Um, so I went there and I was thumbing through it and lo and behold, there's a, a nice half page um, in this sort of memoir of, of the early 80s about Crepuscule. Okay. Um, so that was really nice. So it, it's sort of influential. And I mentioned Lone Lady earlier. And one reason that I got in touch with her and started working with her is I'd noticed in her DJing spots and something, she said that she'd bigged up some of the artists. So I thought, well, this is someone that I ought to know. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can't get over the fact that Factory Records is um, a probably the last really true, tragic, heroic story in pop music. I'm not sure there will be one again or there could be one again. Yeah.
if, for people who don't really know the label, where would they start with Crepuscule? Um, um, they could probably buy one of our compilations. Um, but I think if you, I mean, classic Crepuscule music is Wim Mertens, the Belgian new music composer, um, Anna Domino, probably the best pop artist the label came up with who perhaps could have broken through into the mainstream in the 80s, um, but for various reasons. Um, Tuxedo Moon, fantastic American avant-garde band who relocated to Brussels um, for a good few years. Uh, and in terms of um, newer artists, I mean, I really love the record we did with White C, Morgan Kibbe from M83. Um, and I really love the CD we did by Les Pontis, actually. Uh, it's one <laughs> of my favorites. Um, there were some really good Belgian groups uh, on the label as well. Um, smaller groups, people like Isolation Ward, uh, the names who were uh, really are the link between Factory and Crepuscule, because before Crepuscule even existed, a Belgian group called the names. Um, linked up with Factory. Okay. So they did their first single on Factory in, in 1980, and then they kind of transferred to Crepuscule. And they were a fantastic, um, mm -hmm. very melodic new wave group who kept Martin Hannett as their producer on all of their early records. And they were one of the things that drew me to coming mm -hmm. to Brussels. Actually, I thought, Ooh. as well as people like Tuxedo Moon, uh, the names are there. And yeah. so when I'd been a teenager listening to their album in my bedroom, imagining that's what like life in Europe was really like for a young man, uh, then I could come over and check it out myself. <laughs> um, so the names were a really, really important group in all of this too. Have you thought of your anecdotes? <laughs> um, would it be an anecdote? Do you want an anecdote that's sort of about life in Brussels or something or, or about, I mean, the easiest one that's sort of... Up to you. Okay. <laughs> I think you have to take your responsibility for administering people's catalogue very well. And every so often, you will get surprisingly large offers from people to do various things. So we've done quite a few adverts in the last few years, and they generally tend to come to you for a track which surprises you. Um, so there's a fantastic Crepuscule single called Subway by Thick Pigeon, which we've licensed out for a couple of um, adverts for big fashion houses. Um, and I guess they've just picked it up from YouTube or, or the web and, you know, it's out there. But I think the, the one that really made it clear to me that you've really got to be very careful when you're dealing with big things is five or six years ago when Kanye West sampled a Section 25 track. Um, and they came to us and said, well, we've, we've used part of your track in a new song. So we'd, we'd like to cut a deal with you. And if you're dealing with Kanye West and major companies in America, that's something where you need to get lawyered up yourself. Yeah. Otherwise, you're going to be negligent if yeah, you yeah. get that deal at all wrong, because there are very large sums of money involved. Yeah, of course. So um, that took quite a while to organize, but we did get a, a very good uh, deal for them. Um, and a huge amount of publicity for them as well. Right. Um, so that was really, really interesting to do. It was fantastic for them to get that kudos of, of Kanye West sampling their song and them getting a, a writing credit on the song as well. Yeah, and I with, guess maybe a new audience as well. For sure, yeah. yeah. And I mean, that track now, the original track that he sampled, um, is probably their biggest streaming track. And even though Kanye West didn't even physically release that album, it generated a very large amount of money for Section 25, which meant that we did a lovely five album vinyl box set of that album and were able to really make the artwork something very special. Wow. And that's something we couldn't and probably wouldn't have done without that spike in interest in that work by them and frankly with Kanye's money. Yeah. Um, but I knew when that came in that that's not something I could have done on my own, mm -hmm. that I needed to get one or two other people in to help make sure 
that the group didn't lose out because yeah. you were in over your head and didn't realize it. Yeah. So even though you don't live in Belgium anymore, have you still got a commitment to Belgian music? Yeah. So we've done a couple of the new records we've done uh, in recent years have been Belgian artists, Les Panties. We did two albums by Buscemi as well in the last few years. Uh, and another project I did, because I also have another label called LTM, um, we quite a few years ago did a compilation that I'm still very proud of called B9, which is Belgian Cold Wave, 1979 to 1983. And that's now a double album. Mm -hmm. And that's got two, if we got on there, so you've got Front 242, Neon Judgment, Polyphonic Size, Digital Dance, um, the name Siglo XX, Marine, another fantastic Belgian crepuscule band, Isolation Ward, Alle Alle, Bern Tola, another favourite of mine, and lots of others. That's the kind of sort of historical curating release I really love to do. Yeah, um, beautiful sleeve, uh, really as well. beautiful sleeve. Yeah, yeah. so nice I package. still I still love putting things together like that, um, and that's a compilation I remain inordinately proud of, actually. Yeah, that's great. It's really um, a nice item. Is that um, on sale? Where would that be on sale? Uh, Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope there are some um, shops in Belgium that um, carry these things. I don't really quite know what the distribution situation is, but that's that's on CD um, and uh, and vinyl. The vinyl is probably the best one to get because it's an op art sleeve, which is originally designed by Victor Vasarely. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not really a great story for radio, but you can see the colours on it are red, blue, dark blue. So there's any number of quite nice coloured vinyl yeah, combinations true. you can do that perfectly match with the sleeve. Of course, yeah. And I'm not a huge fan of coloured vinyl. However, if it keys in with the artwork really nicely, as that one does, then actually... I talked earlier about the idea of a, a double vinyl or a vinyl being an art object. Mm -hmm. I think something like this is an art object. Totally, yeah. Uh, and you can you can contribute to that with the colour of the vinyl. Um, so yeah, that's that's one of my favourite releases actually. Fabulous. Avec le soutien de Sabam for Culture.